The Portuguese police have issued an apology to the McCants. Should the police have done that? If not, why did they do it? I have my own thoughts. I'm Deception Detective. I'm an attorney trained in statement analysis, and this channel exists to expose lies and manipulation. Before we get into the video, please hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. In today's episode, we're going to continue an interview that Piers Morgan did with the McCanns. And we're actually at the part of the interview here where he asks the McCanns about their interaction with the Portuguese police. So we're going to listen to this part of the interview. I've not heard it before, so you'll be hearing it with me. But as we listen, let's try to uncover a the thoughts of the Portuguese police which might give us a clue why they just issued this apology to the McCanns so many years later. And as we always do on my channel, listen to the words of the McCanns to see if we can figure out the truth of what happened the night that Madeline went missing. So that, to me, would seem more oh, suspicious. Yeah, absolutely. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the moment that you realized for the first time that the Portuguese police were not looking for anybody else in connection with Madness' disappearance. They were looking at you. When the mood began to change, massive media attention, a lot of criticism against the Portuguese police and authorities for not moving quickly enough, not doing their job properly, and they retaliate, it seems to me, or they respond, let's be polite here, in the worst possible way, as far as you're concerned. They, they make you formal suspects, our Guido. What was the moment like for you when you heard that was happening? Because that completely changed things. I mean, I think this had gone on probably sort of end of July into sure. August, really. Um, there was certainly a change in the media coverage. If you've seen my previous videos on the McCanns, I've done five of them now. You'll know my opinion of what happened that night. And I do believe, based on what the McCanns have said, right, without much outside knowledge at all of the case, although many of you have clued me into extra details in the comments, which is uh, very insightful. Without much knowledge of the case, the McCanns, based on their own words, have leaked through the words that they choose what I suspect actually happened that night. And so far, I'm crystallizing my opinion, but I feel that they over-sedated Maddie on the night that she allegedly disappeared, and she died from over-sedation, right? So they were trying to put her to bed to calm her down so that they could go enjoy their vacation. As a result, she died. Uh, Jerry was there when she died. And then they scripted a story together of their alibi, and they've stuck to it ever since, that some third unknown party kidnapped Madeline and ran off with her. And I think what they really did was dispose of the body somewhere cold, whether that was the ocean or somewhere else, just based on their language. To me, it sounds like they disposed of the body somewhere cold. Now, um, how they did this are... Uh, the exact night Madeline died, let's say she, some people say there's a theory she died three nights before, whatever that may be, that's not my job, right? If it comes on language, I'll add it to my uh, thesis here. But how they pulled off burying her or um, storing the body until they could take it to the water, I haven't figured that out yet, right? So it's kind of like seeing a magic trick. Just because I don't know how the magic trick was accomplished doesn't mean magic exists, right? I just haven't seen that angle yet. So like I say, so far, I think Madeline was over sedated. I feel like Jerry was there when she died. And I think that they disposed of her body uh, somewhere cold, most likely the ocean, a body of water. And if you want to know how I came up with all that, you'd need to watch these videos because we formulated this thesis over the course of five interviews now in three, uh, five videos in three interviews, right? And this is the third interview we're still analyzing. So I think all that is to say, I think the Portuguese police suspected the McCanns from day one because their story was so far-fetched and because the McCanns are very 
A, unsophisticated liars. They're not psychopaths. At least they don't lie like someone like Casey Anthony, who can lie point blank and actually update her lies as she needs to. Right, so they, they might have that. I'm not a clinician, so I can't diagnose them. But they are not as good as a confirmed psychopath like Casey Anthony. What I feel they did is they had to script their alibi, and they've stuck to that script ever since. So it's a, it's a little bit harder for them to lie, which is why they have so much leakage and why they have to stick to their script so tightly. And why you'll see in interviews why they're constantly glancing at each other um, or cutting each other off, right? To make sure that no one veers off the script. So um, I think that the fact that they are not particularly good liars and the type of lying they're doing is extremely complicated where they have to lie by omission, right? So they have to omit finding a dead body and they have to lie by commission where they actually have to add other details like the window being open when Kate checked the bedroom, right? So it's a complicated form of lying on top of which they have to corroborate their own stories between each other, which adds an extra dimension of complexity to the lie. And I covered that in, uh, in this video, how to spot a fake story. So all that is to say, I think the, pol the Portuguese police suspected them from day one and were pretty confident of their suspicion, which is why they didn't launch some huge um, search campaign. In reality, they had their suspects and likely culprits right in front of them. So, so they didn't need to launch a huge campaign. However, they got offended or got on the defensive when British media started pestering them and questioning what they were doing. And I'm going to develop this theme later when we talk about the recent apology that they issued to the McCanns. But part of finding the truth is A, having the technical skills, which I'm teaching you on this channel to recognize the truth. But two, A, you need the skills and B, you actually need the courage to stick by your convictions. Right. And I think I'm foreshadowing where I'm going to get to with these Portuguese police and their apology and actually the way they acted even at the time Madeline went missing. So let's keep listening. And it was obvious that things were being leaked, stories were being leaked to the media to smear us essentially or to show us in a negative light. Um, and that's, I think, when we still to sense the hostility. And that coincided with a time where suddenly our communication, our meetings with the police stopped. So not only were we having to face all that negativity and, and lies, um, we were also left in this void of information. And we found out that we were going to be made our guido. A void of information. If you've seen my other videos, you know that leakage happens when people are under stress. And I never miss an opportunity with the McCanns to pick up on a strange word choice. Does this mean they buried Maddie in a void, in a dark hole, maybe the ocean or a tunnel or a cave? No, right? Does not mean that. However, enough drops can make a river. And if I were in charge of the case, listening to these interviews, I would be allocating my resources to looking at the ocean, in caves nearby, in dark crevices, because they continue to wor use words that sound like leakage to me, right? So listen to how she says this. Is this technically proper English? Yes. Is it a bizarre word choice? Yes, right? And that's usually what leakage is. When someone has something on their mind and the word, the truth slips through, through a seemingly benign word choice. So I will continue to point out this leakage. So listen to what she says here, void. To face all that negativity and, and lies, um, we were also left in this void of information. A void? We were left in a void of information. Was Maddie left in a void? Was her body left in uh, a cave or a a cold cave, right? Or in the void of the ocean, right? The dark abyss. We were left in a void of information. Our meetings with the police stopped. So not only were we having to face all that negativity and, and lies, um, we were also left in this void of information. We were left in a void of information. That is strange word choice. But leakage, as you'll know, if you've seen my other videos, 
is common with people who are lying, right? Surprisingly common. And as I said before, if, if you think to yourself, hey, I don't leak the truth when I'm lying. What's he talking about? I don't slip up and reveal the truth. If I buried something, I wouldn't say void. Um, it's actually more common than you might think, especially under stress. So A, the McCanns have to omit leakage, so they have to not reveal the truth. Just consider how much stress they're under right now. They're on live TV. They have to coordinate their stories with each other. They have to watch peers and make sure he's buying their story. Otherwise, they need to keep talking and filibustering um, before he can ask them a more pressing question. There's many factors that they're considering right now, which makes them more open to leakage, which makes it more likely that they might have a slip of the tongue. And as I pointed out on a, on a previous video, I actually experienced leakage myself on another McCann's video. And one of you eagle-eyed or eagle-eared listeners actually caught it and put it in the comments where you noticed that after I mentioned I thought they uh, buried Maddie at sea, I used lots of phrases that weren't quite appropriate. For example, I said, I haven't done a deep dive into Spanish lately, where a better expression would have been, I haven't brushed up on my Spanish lately. Um, and I also said, will we get to the bottom of this story? And I think I used that phrase ra rather than, you know, will we find the truth or will we figure out what happened? I said, will we get to the bottom of the story? Because in my mind, I was picturing Maddie at the bottom of the ocean. So leakage even happened to myself under very low stress, right? I'm, I'm just recording a video by myself. I'm not on live TV. So the chances for leakage are very high. So if you catch them using a strange phrase um, and I miss it here, put it in the comments. I try to read all of your comments. And if I write nice catch and give you the little hundred and uh, uh, dartboard emoji, it means I'm really impressed with what you said. And I might actually feature your comment when we do a wrap up video at some point about this where, or a Q and A where I want to feature some of the best catches from from my listeners, because as you know, I think I have the smartest, uh, best audience on YouTube. And um, we found out that we were going to be made our Guido. Don't you must be the, the worst moment of all, other than the moment you know that Madeline's gone, to have somebody look you in the eye and effectively say to... I wish Piers hadn't corrected him, himself there. Imagine if he had said that must have been the worst moment and they said yes. That means that them being accused of Maddie's disappearance was worse than her actual uh, disappearance or death, right? Which would be very telling. Kind of like in the other episode where we predicted the McCanns, how they would answer a question Pierce had about the hotel, which was very damning, which I still think is one of the best signs, in my opinion, that they are guilty. To both of you, we think you killed your daughter. That's a terrible moment, isn't it? Well, I just thought, what is going on here? It's the, the, you know, the, okay. I thought, you're right, nothing as worse as the first night, but I just felt like we were about to get destroyed at that point. Yeah, I think the realisation, and this particular part for Kate, that effectively there was no ongoing search because there was clearly a strategy where the public uh, were being led to believe that... the. Did you sedate Maddie? Great question. I think, maybe I should just get into this now. Why do people, why did the Portuguese police apologize to the McCanns? Why do people believe the McCanns when, in my opinion, their lies are very obvious? I think it's a lack of courage. To catch a liar, you have to have the technical knowledge to actually know they're lying, but then you actually have to have the conviction and the courage to stand by your own analysis, even if the entire world is against you. And people have tried to chase, chase me off my opinions on this channel ever since my first video. When I accused Liver King of taking steroids, plenty of people came to my channel and said, no, 
you know, he, he gets tested all the time. He's a hundred percent natural, impossible. Uh, you know, he's your subprimal until a, a few weeks after I made my videos, he admitted he was on steroids or even the, my videos on Jada Pinkett Smith calling her a sadist. People call me uh, a racist in the comments or my videos exposing me to hoaxers, a misogynist. It'd be a lot easier to walk back my opinions. But part of catching liars is actually having the conviction to stick with it. And this isn't rare. It's, I think it's rare in, in the media, unfortunately. But attorneys, prosecutors, uh, they stick by their convictions um, against direct threats to their lives. So courage is out there. There are plenty of people who can recognize truth and have the courage to stick to it. However, I feel like the people in the media were covering this case were bullied into walking back what they knew. Because look how accusatory this first article is that we're looking at on the screen here. And if you're listening on podcast mode, it's an article from about the time Maddie went missing. And the headline in massive bold letters is, did you sedate Maddie? That's a great headline. I actually think they nailed it until they were forced, they were cowered down and forced to walk it back. Even on my last McCann's video, uh, people told me, oh, the McCann's are very litigious. They might sue you. Don't you know that the Portuguese police issued an apology to them? That means nothing to me, right? If the McCann's were to sue me, I w it would open them up to discovery. I would love for it. I would love to sit them down and do a deposition with them because I would not walk back. So I feel like they pick and choose. They, they focus on people who can be bullied and coward. So I think the press back then were bullied into walking back their story, at least the British press. And I feel like the, these Portuguese police recently were bullied into issuing an apology to, M to McCann's by the British and I think the German government, right? Don't they allegedly have some person who they're accusing of having done it? I think they cowered. Do they know the truth? I think so. I think the police since day one have suspected the truth. And I should show you this funny video quickly. Whenever someone has said, right, your McCann's analysis contradicts the BBC, the police, uh, the UK government, the German government, this is my internal response from the great Christopher Hitchens. My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this can pick a number, get online, and kiss my ass. <laughs> right, that's how I feel about it. Until I see something that updates my analysis, I'm going to stick to my guns. And unfortunately, I think if the British press had done that in the beginning and the Portuguese police had done that in the beginning, we would see both of the McCanns in prison for negligence or at least manslaughter, um, negligent death of their daughter. That there was evidence that Madeline was dead and that simply wasn't the case. I mean, Jerry, you, you kept remarkably calm. <clears throat> that, that almost played to your disadvantage. People thought, why is he being so calm? Had you been hysterical, they'd say, why is he being so hysterical? You can't win in that position. You don't see me behind the scenes. But, but you were remarkable. The other thing Pierce is pointing out here, and this is why I don't look at body language, is because Pierce is right. People criticize Jerry for being stoic, but if he'd been hysterical and running around, he would have been criticized for being overly persuasive. So that right there is accurate. Is is Jerry a likable, charismatic guy? No. Does that make him a murderer? No. In my mind, what makes him a murderer are the things that he has said. We evolved to communicate with speech. So it is very difficult to lie with our speech. Because if you're lying about something that happened, it is extremely complex to picture things, to say them again the same way, to memorize every detail, to coordinate details. You are much more likely to get caught, tripped up, in your words, right? All I do is listen closely. And there are some research and empirical studies to show that certain words and phrases are used in certain situations to uh, demonstrate deception. 
But really, all we do on this channel is listen closely to what people say. Whereas if you're focusing on, is he crying enough? Well, she looks haggard. Um, they're looking at each other a lot. That doesn't, so what? That doesn't mean anything. Even if their kid were actually kidnapped, they, they would be looking haggard and, and acting uh, sad. Right? So looking at their behavior doesn't really tell us much, in my opinion. Because if they bludgeoned her to death or accidentally sedated her to death or she was actually kidnapped, they'd be acting, as far as their emotions go, similar, right? It's a tragedy no matter what. The way the truth is revealed is in the words they choose, because the words they choose demonstrate their knowledge. You always speak based on everything you know. And that's what I'm curious about. What do they know? And I think that's why the leakage is so important in this case, because the leakage reveals things that they are picturing in their minds. It reveals their memories. Void. The pain is never far from the surface. These are all expressions they've used. And one on its own probably means nothing. But we've seen so many patterns throughout this interview that it is tough to ignore. And like I said, if I were in charge of the case, just based on that leakage, I would be prioritizing searching along the coastline or searching within a day's drive of that hotel to any coastline or caves or uh, construction sites. Anywhere with a void, a, a deepness to it, and a coldness to it. Mark could be calm. I mean, if I'd been in your shoes and I'd been accused of something like that, I, I think I would have freaked out. How did you manage to keep your composure? I think the key thing is, um, I mean, as I say, behind the scenes, I what you see... is very different. Um, I mean, I saw my husband on the floor crying his eyes out, you know, um, so I think... Uh, I mean, at that point, um, at the lowest point, I... I saw my husband on the floor crying his, class, crying his eyes out. I wonder if she's describing the night Madeline died. Like I said, I think he was there when she actually passed away, when she actually expired. Could she be describing the night, that night of Jerry crying, holding his daughter while she was dying? I think what privately is very different. Um, I mean, I saw my husband on the floor crying his eyes out, you know. Um, so I think... Uh, I mean, at that point, um, at the lowest point, I thought our family was going to be destroyed or the potential for it to be destroyed was there. I thought our family was going to be destroyed. Well, Madeline's missing. So the family unit is destroyed. So what does he mean by that? Let's listen again, right? Because he, he is saying in his own words that the family unit is not destroyed yet even though Madeline's missing. So when he talks about the family unit here, he's talking about himself, Kate, and the twins, right? The remaining members of the family. How could they get destroyed? How could they get destroyed when the parents are under suspicion? Listen again. I think I have an answer here. Let's see if we're on the same wavelength. So I think... Uh... I mean, at that point, um, at the lowest point, I thought our family was going to be destroyed or the potential for it to be destroyed was there. But ultimately, in particular... The potential for their family to be destroyed while Madeline's already gone. How could the family be destroyed? Well, if the parents are convicted of negligence, the parents could be locked away. And the twins would go into foster care. That's how you destroy the rest of the family. So I think that one way they justify covering up Madeline's death is protecting the rest of the family, not just themselves. Right? They are, they are clearly a priority for each other. In all these interviews, one of their main priorities is defending themselves. However, they might also see this as a heroic effort to protect they're twins. Because if the truth ever does come out, they will surely be arrested and locked away, and the twins would go into foster care. I think that's what he's imagining there 
when he says our family could have been destroyed and the potential was there. Which is true, whether Madeline was kidnapped and they were wrongly accused or if they killed her and they were correctly convicted. Either way. So I think what it reveals here is a little bit more about their motivation. They're not just protecting each other. They may also, they're definitely considering the twins as well. So even though they have to lie for a living now, they may see it as noble because they're protecting their remaining two children. So when they didn't answer the questions in the polygraph, which would have incriminated them, if you really believe Madeline was missing, the heroic thing to do would be to answer every question, be as candid as possible with the investigation so that they could eliminate themselves as suspects and the police could go find the real kidnapper. But because they knew they were guilty, they found it more justifiable and heroic for the remaining children to not reply to questions and to lie because at least that way they can protect the remaining children. They already know Madeline's already dead. So avoiding answering the questions and lying to the police is actually the noble thing to do. I think that's how they justify all this. Take them and you're tired and you're doing that. You, you come back and the overwhelming objective that we have is to find Madeline and what you need to do to get through that and to keep that search going. But I, I mean, we should be clear there was no formal accusation. No. Uh, we were never arrested. There were no charges. And their Guido thing literally, tran you know, is translated as suspect. But it would be, you could argue if we'd been made our Guido on day one because they had to ask us some questions mm -hmm. which might incriminate you, that would have been fine. And in the August, I said, look, if we have to start from... It's a strange admission that the questions he, he would have been asked could have incriminated him. What he should be saying is they could have exonerated him. It's interesting how they never get pushed back in person. Which is why I would love to be able to do a deposition with them. Because these slip-ups are hard to explain if you actually press them. What do you mean? For example, he had said that. What do you mean they could have incriminated you? Well, I mean, but no, you said incriminated. Which question, which question specifically could have incriminated you? No one ever pushes back on them like that, which is unfortunate. Square one again, you know, bring it on and we, we will be there and, and do it. But there was clearly a portrayal in the media that there was evidence incriminating us. And, you know, we were clearly suggested that if we confess to hiding Madeline's body, then... That's weird. Let's listen. There was evidence incriminating us and, you know, we were clearly suggested that if we confessed to hiding Madeline's body, then that would be the end of it. Were you offered a specific deal like that? Were you offered a, a if, you, if you accept that you did this, you can go to prison for two years and be out? Yeah. That was what I read. Is that, is that true? It is true. I mean, it, it's it's hard because no, nobody likes it to be called a deal, but indirectly it was put to us that um, if we confess to hiding Madeline's body, so not killing her, but accidental death, and if we confess to hiding her body, then it would be a non-custodial service, two years. Um, Jerry could go back to work, we were told. Um, but I was just crazy, you know, the hardest thing, as you say, about the Arguido was the realisation suddenly that no one was looking for Madeline. Because if they were looking at us and focusing all their attention and resources are on us or trying to find stuff again. First of all, the fact that the Portuguese police offered that deal to them is a sign that the Portuguese police were on the right track. The Portuguese police, it sounds like, were actually on the same page as I am, where Madeline died through... Uh, negligence through some sort of tragic accident and what they are guilty of is disposing of her body and covering it up. I would have offered them the same deal to get a confession and get this over with. But they didn't take it. And I think this goes back to what I was saying before. 
their family. That might have been what he was referring to. That deal could have blown apart their family. Madeline was already gone. So when he's referring to the family, he's talking about himself, Kate, and the twins. If both parents were in prison, the children would, would be taken away. And the family would have blown up. Another question I get asked a lot in the comments is, why would these parents do so many interviews if they were guilty? I think it's because they are petrified of losing control of the narrative. As you see here, when the police are pointing at the finger at them and suspecting them, their main concern was, don't even look at us. Go find the person who took her. Rather than being cooperative in answering every question like you would expect a parent of a missing child to do, parents of missing children are extremely cooperative because they want to eliminate themselves as suspects. They understand that they are the primary suspect. It's perfectly logical that the first person they look at is the parents. So they understand that they submit themselves to any test, any investigation, any amount of questions in order to eliminate themselves as suspects so the police can turn their attention to finding their child. But the McCanns didn't do that. When the police started suspecting them, they immediately started complaining, why are you looking at us? Go look for the person who took Madeline. And I think they've been doing that ever since. Whenever the heat is on them, they need to go into public, write a book, do an interview, because they constantly have to be pointing the finger somewhere else because they have not eliminated them themselves as suspects. They have not sat down for intense questioning or a polygraph. As, as dubious of, as polygraph tests are, the person of a missing child would submit themselves to it in order to clear their name. So I think that is why the McCanns are constantly doing interviews, because they are petrified of losing control of the narrative. Because as soon as the search stops, people are going to look back at them. The obvious culprits, the ones who should have been investigated with rigor from day one. Against us and who was looking for Madeline. So I was angry. I mean, I'd gone from kind of this downward spiraling. The other thing, when people act surprised by obvious things, for example, when they say, how could the Portuguese police suspect, suspect, suspect us? The parents. That's obvious. Everyone knows that. If a wife is murdered, the first suspect is the husband. Everyone knows that. If a kid goes missing, the first suspects are the parents. So to act surprised by that is a red flag. And we actually caught uh, someone by doing this. So let's do a quick cut here and I'll show you the example where someone, where I caught someone on X lying simply by acting surprised by something that was obvious. If you're familiar with American uh, politics, you know that uh, Republic, or, uh, Democrat Representative Jamal Bowman pulled a fire alarm during an important vote and then claimed that he pulled the fire alarm by accident. And recently he was charged with it. And I think he was guilty and I thought he was guilty ever since day one. And as I put in my notes when I analyzed his statement about it, one of the things he said in his uh, statement about this, where he was trying to defend himself and pretend it was an accident, he said, I don't know why this has gotten so much attention. And that's kind of like how the McCann's feign surprise that they get attention for being suspects by the Portuguese police. Pulling a fire alarm is, is designed, a fire alarm is designed to get attention, whether you pull it by accident or not. So acting surprised that people are paying attention to someone who pulled a fire alarm is a red flag. The same way that acting surprised as a parent that you are a suspect is a red flag. I hope that makes sense. In July, when nobody was really speaking to us in August with all the headlines, and suddenly I just felt strong because I thought, you know, I'm damned if this will happen to my daughter. You know, if they're not going to be there for her, then we have to fight for her. 
I'm going to take another short break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the fight that you then launched to try and find Madeline and what you think are the possible unanswered questions that need to be answered. We welcome the news today, although it is no cause for celebration. It's hard to describe how utterly despairing it was to be named our Guido. So we're still watching the Piers Morgan interview, but now we're doing a flashback, it looks like, to the McCanns back when Madeline first went missing. And they're doing a press conference announcing that they are now Arguido, suspects by the Portuguese police. Um, and subsequently portrayed in the media as suspects in our own daughter's abduction. That was just after you'd been informed you were no longer... Once again, our own daughter's abduction. That has been their story ever since day one. She was abducted. And as I've harped on many times in my videos, the conclusiveness that she was abducted is a red flag. The same way acting surprised that you as a parent are a suspect is a red flag. If a child goes missing, the word we use is missing. Because any number of things could have happened to the child. And that is why in this video, How to Spot a Fake Story, we looked at scripting. I believe the McCanns scripted the story of the abductor around the time that Madeline died because they knew they needed an alibi. And the easiest way for liars to coordinate their stories is to come up with a simple one that's vague with very rigid details. So as you'll notice, they've stuck to that story since day one. She's been abducted. But they contradict themselves in their actions. For example, they never accuse each other. They never accuse their friends. Allegedly, their friend Matt was the last one to check on the children before Kate. Why, is he, why were they not pointing the finger at him? Why, in the previous part of this interview we analyzed, did they exonerate the hotel? If they didn't know what actually happened, all these things should be in play. Our daughter is missing is a much more reliable statement. It indicates that the parent doesn't actually know what happened compared to our child was abducted when there's no evidence of that. Uh, an open window is not evidence that your child is abducted. So uh, the conclusiveness, and we see it all the way back to those early days. That press conference we just saw was, was uh, from around the time Madeline went missing. The interview we're watching now is 2011. The story has never changed, never evolved. New details have never been added. New reminiscences and details that might have cropped up the more they thought about that night have never bubbled up because it was a scripted story from day one, and they are petrified to death of anyone challenging challenging that story are following a different path, which is why they do so many interviews, and they are petrified of adding too many new details to it or evolving it for fear of contradicting themselves. Are Guido no longer suspects, as they call it there? And whilst there's relief in your voice, Kate, there's also, I can tell, real simmering anger. What did it do to, to your public opinion, particularly back home? here where it was such an enormous story you were front page news for weeks after weeks after months after months a lot of it negative a lot of it pushing really hard as almost as if some of the media wanted you to be guilty i remember reading the headlines thinking wow they're pushing the envelope here this is how you bully people so normally i like peers but this is how i think people bullied the media into backing off the McCants. How could you be so accusatory? Their daughter is missing. I'm sure plenty of people said that to the journalists who were actually on the right track, in my opinion. Right, you come off as a bad person if you're accusing parents of missing child doing it. However, we're not doing it based on a crystal ball. We're doing it based on their own language. And their own language indicates that they have knowledge outside the facts that are presented to us. In other words, they know what actually happened. You're having to live 
in this country. And you're having to live with being called our Guido suspect. That same sort of bullying is the reason so many hoaxers got away with it during that Me Too movement. Plenty of actual victims came forward, but so did plenty of hoaxers. And even if people were intelligent enough to see the hoaxers and recognize the hoaxers, they didn't have the courage to stick by their convictions and actually call out the hoaxers, even when everyone else was saying, believe all women. It takes courage to stick by your convictions against people who look like sympathetic victims. When I defended Andrew, when I analyzed the Andrew Tate accusers, the two women who accused him, plenty of people accused me of being a misogynist or a, a woke, crazy liberal. And then when I did the opposite to Russell Brand, uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, it's inverse. When I defended uh, Andrew Tate based on those two accusers, right? So when I saw the two accusers who accused him of sexual harassment, people said I was alt-right, uh, crazy Republican. And then when I said I don't believe Russell Brand's denial of uh, regarding his accusers, I was accused of being a woke, liberal, hive mind Either one of those, if you don't have the conviction in your own analysis and the courage to stand by it, could, could get you to back off your opinion. It's also one of the reasons I wear the hat and the glasses and don't reveal my name. Because people can actually get way too invested in celebrities. And if you call them a liar, they can actually go crazy and try to come for you personally. So I feel like not revealing my identity allows me, or nor my politics, allows me to call things as I see them as honestly as possible. And in this case, these are two parents who lost a daughter, which is sad. That is sad whether they did it by accident or whether she was actually kidnapped. It is a sad, tragic situation. However, my channel exists to expose liars and manipulators and I feel that they are lying and they manipulate the public's opinion by being litigious or playing the victim card or doing a whole bunch of other things to get people to uh, not, not push too hard the narrative that they actually did it. Specs. That must have been a pretty awful experience, wasn't it? You know, it was a great story for the media, but you're right. I mean, this was our life. We were having to live it, you know. Um, I think it's a bad episode for the media, you know, because obviously we took action against the Express and uh, it was a last resort, but they were rehashing headlines from months before over and over again. And we were prepared to cut a bit of slack around our Guido time. We were declared our Guido. These things were happening in Portugal. But, you know, months later, um, and some of the stories were just complete fabrications. It was detrimental to the search. I think the other important issue was the stories that were being put out there were implying that Madeline was dead. Yeah. Of all the madcap theories. That's interesting. Like I've said in my another McCann video, if I call you purple, you won't be offended by it because you're not purple. But if I call you low IQ and you are, you've done a test and you have a low IQ, that's going to offend you because it's true. So notice how Kate brings up the headlines that actually offended her. Fabrications. It was detrimental to the South. I think the other important issue was the stories that were being put out there were implying that Madeline was dead. Yeah. Of all of them. Which, if your daughter is missing is totally reasonable. As sad as it is, your daughter could be dead. If the news is publishing stories after months of a missing girl and saying she might be dead, that is 100% reasonable within the realm of possibility. In fact, much more likely with such a high, highly investigated, let's say it was a kidnapping. If it got this much press and attention, 
you can believe they got rid of the body. They would either issue a ransom note or get rid of the girl. So why does Kate bring that up? Why would that offend her so much when it's totally within the realm of possibility? Why did she mention that that particular sort of headline made her sensitive? Just complete fabrication. It was detrimental to the South. I think the other important issue was the stories that were being put out there were implying that Madeline was dead. Okay. Why would you need an injunction against, against that? Because they killed her. Why else would you be sensitive about that? It might be sad to think about or offensive, or you might actually want to avoid those headlines. But if journalists are over there in Portugal investigating this case for you, which is what you say you want, and coming up with evidence that Madeline's dead, would you not be curious about that evidence? Would you not be curious about finding out the truth? They show zero curiosity about whether or not Madeline is alive or dead because they already know the truth. And that's why they're sensitive about articles about her being dead. Because they know that's what happened. They know they did it and they do not want people. If someone's finding evidence of that, they are scared because the evidence will point them to Madeline's body, which will point to them being the killers. That's my suspicion. Nobody put that particular headline in Kate's mouth. That was a priority to her. She brought up that particular line of inquiry and headlines up as the ones that she was most sensitive about, which is very telling. Yeah. Of all the madcap theories, then you must see more than anybody else. You must hear and see everything that comes out about this. Are there any that you think have any kind of credibility that you think should be really pushed for? Okay. Let's see if we can predict their answer again. We did this with the hotel question. When Piers asked them, do you blame the hotel at all? I predicted they would say no. Because someone who knows that Madeline is dead would not want to make new enemies by accusing the hotel. Because if they accuse the hotel, the hotel can defend themselves by pointing the finger back at the McCann's and they don't want that. So here, Pierce says, he asked them, are any of the theories possibly true? If your child was missing, you would be pursuing every theory, no matter how ludicrous it is. From a dingo stole the baby, to a vulture broke into the room and stole the baby, to one of their friends is playing a five-year sick, messed up practical joke on them, to... Kate kidnapped her own daughter and hit her in the suitcase and didn't ter- tell Jerry, right? Everything would be on the table because you want to find out what happened to your daughter. Now, if you're a hoaxer, you are petrified of anyone searching anything outside of your alibi. You want to direct the narrative down the course of your alibi. And that's why Actual parents of missing children don't go on 20-year press tours because they're more concerned about the investigation of their kid. They're not interested in going on Swedish talk shows. You go on Swedish talk shows because you're trying to control a narrative. So for everyone who asks me why do they do so many interviews, if they're guilty, innocent parents are the ones who don't do a ton of interviews because they're more concerned with the actual investigation and doing things that actually help them find their kid. Hoaxers do interviews. I have a whole playlist about hoaxers. These people are all over the press because part of it is uh, getting attention for hoaxers. In this case, these hoaxers are petrified of losing control of the narrative. So when Pierce asks her, do any of these other theories hold any credibility or any credence to you? I suspect she will minimize it. She will try to direct it back to her alibi, which is a, an unknown third party, suspicious man in the shadows stole their daughter. Push further. Anybody else you must hear and see everything that, that comes out there were implying that Madeline was dead. 
Yeah. Of all the madcap theories, then you must see more than anybody else. You must hear and see everything that comes out about this. Are there any that you think have any kind of credibility that you think should be really pushed further? It's incredibly difficult, Pierce, because if you speak to Ernie Allen at the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, who've got the most expertise in these types of stranger or, or stereotypical kidnappings, what Ernie says and it's stuck with us is, until you know who's taken your daughter, you don't know. So nothing, as, as predicted, the response is directed back to the alibi, an unknown unnamed kidnapper it's textbook this is what hoaxers sound like you can watch my hoaxers playlist of people talking about ufos aliens bigfoot they sound exactly the same here the conclusiveness is the key that someone is not curious about the truth and if your child is missing you should be obsessed you should be curious as hell about every possibility, even the most outlandish possibilities. But hoaxers are not curious because they know the truth. Many times their grift or their attention-seeking endorphin rush or here their um, ability to remain unconvicted relies on being conclusive about their story. They have a stake in making sure no one looks outside the realm of their hoax. And here, Jerry answered textbook. If he was asked, are any of these headlines have any, let's listen to the actual question again, because even uh, headlines about Madeline being dead should be of interest to them. But instead, they're trying to shut them down. If you didn't know what happened to your daughter, wouldn't you at least like to be able to retrieve the body? More than anybody else, you must hear and see everything that, that comes uh, out about this. Are there any that you think have any kind of credibility that you think should be really pushed further? It's incredibly difficult, Pierce, because if you speak to Ernie Allen at the National Centre for Men So no headline, nothing. No theory that she's dead, no theory... I don't know what the theories were. There's tons of theories. Even the one, but particularly ones that she's dead, have zero interest. Generate zero interest in the parents because they're hoaxing, because they know what actually happened, in my opinion. For missing exploited children who've got the most expertise in these types of stranger or, or stereotypical kidnappings, what Ernie says, and it's stuck with us, is until you know who's taken your daughter, you don't know. And you can think of a whole host of scenarios. And I think that he's given us some examples. When Elizabeth Smart was abducted at knife point from her bedroom, uh, which she shared with her sister. It's always an abduction. That's the alibi. Yet they contradict themselves. And that's what I mean by not being sophisticated liars. It could be anybody, except for my friends, except for Matt, who was the last person to check the bedroom, and except for the hotel staff. Definitely not them. The conclusiveness that it is a, an unknown, unidentified third party who didn't work at the hotel, who's not one of their friends, who isn't either of them, that is how you know it's a hoax. I know I'm beating the point to death here, but uh, there are still people who believe them. I said, there's no way we could have known that she would be living and they, that may have been, might have been leakage from me, right? Beating something to death. Just miles from home. It would have been leakage if I had said, I know I'm putting you to sleep with all this. That would have been leakage because that would actually reveal my thoughts about Maddie. I don't think they beat her to death. Um, JC Dugard. I mean, all of these cases... Who could have imagined it? So we've got to be completely open-minded as to who's taken her and why. And I right, so the contradiction. They contradict themselves constantly. We have to be open to all possibilities. However, these possibilities are closed off. I don't think we'll know until we find that person. One of the things I struck by in the book is, is your quite open account of what it's done to your marriage, this. I mean, do you feel that You've been quite fortunate to stay together. Do you think? 
this is a whole other can of worms. And I've pointed this out multiple times about how parents of missing children often get divorced. As I always say, this is an extremely content-rich interview, so let's break this up into part four. If you haven't subscribed yet, I do premieres on these videos, so you can actually chat with me and the other detectives in the live chat. It's a lot of fun. Last time we had hundreds of people in the live chat. So please do subscribe, join us in the live chat, let us know your thoughts. Until next time, stay true.